We'd like to give you a flavour of the work of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. There are many supporters of the school uh, among us today, and this is our little way of acknowledging in beautiful pictures and sound how far the school has come because of your support. Thank you very much and enjoy the video. The mission of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy is to train the next generation of Asian leaders and world leaders. Quality of leadership that is provided by Asian societies will help not just the populations of Asia, but the world as a whole. The establishment of the school is timely as there's a need for Asia-focused case studies in public policy. One of the biggest advantages that the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy has is that it is located in one of the best public policy laboratories in the whole world, which of course is Singapore. We are financially the strongest school in Asia. As a result of that, we are also the second most generous school of public policy in the world after the Princeton Woodrow Wilson School. We also have faculty who've had practical experience in some of the leading international organizations in the world, like IMF, World Bank, World Health Organization, Asian Development Bank. And so we are able to inject both the theoretical and the practitioner's point of view into the classroom. Our academic programs are designed to turn out highly skilled professionals. It is our goal to equip our students with the means and knowledge and skills that will enable them to contribute richly to public policy development and administration wherever they go. Some of the things that impress me most about the school are the weekly prominent guest lectures that the school organizes and the possibility of taking classes across schools. We have extensive partnerships with established schools of public policy, such as the Harvard Kennedy School. These partnerships offer opportunities to our students to earn double degrees and to go on exchanges. The classroom is made up of students that come from over 50 countries. 80% of our students are international students. This diversity is what enriches the classroom at the Lee Kuan Yew School, and it's something that we're really proud of. Apart from being a PhD student, I'm also working as a research associate at the Asia Competitiveness Institute here within the school. And my involvement with their project so far has allowed me to travel, work with other professors on joint papers, and also present our findings to policymakers from around the region. The school has six research areas. The two most important areas for us are social policy and public management. And in social policy, we look at such important areas as health, the future of cities and urbanism, and the role of pensions and aging in very rapidly changing societies. Uh, and in public management, we look at how government and public institutions more generally work and sometimes don't work. There are four research centers in the school. The Asia Competitiveness Institute, as the name suggests, deals with competitiveness in Asia and the factors that make one society more or less competitive than the other. The Center on Asia and Globalization looks interestingly at how Asia is shaping globalization rather than as we've got used to it the other way around. The third institute, the Institute of Water Policy, looks at the management, pricing, availability, and quality of water. Finally, we have the Institute of Policy Studies, which is focused on Singapore, and it asks about the prospects of governance and Singapore's governance model. Executive education at Lee Kuan Yew School caters to the needs of time-constrained decision-makers and leaders. We work very closely with our clients to make sure that the programs are customised around their needs. The programs themselves range from a few days to a few months long, and every year we train around 2,000 people. They come from places as diverse as India, China, ASEAN, Afghanistan, the Middle East. And we also partner with organizations like the Asian Development Bank, the United Nations, and the World Bank. The great advantage of public policy education is that when you graduate from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, you can join either the public sector, the private sector, or the not-for-profit sector. But our hope is that the vast majority of our students will use their skills to improve the lives of other people. Because at the end of the day, our mission is to try and transform the governance of Asia and improve the lives of millions, if not billions, of people.
once again, thank you to uh, the supporters of the school. And before we begin, another reminder to please put your phones and electronic devices on silent mode, please. Ready to begin? Former President of the Republic of Singapore, Mr. S. R. Nathan, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, welcome to our very special ninth anniversary conference titled The Big Ideas of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Far more significant than the school's anniversary, of course, is that today marks the 90th birthday of the founding father of modern independent Singapore, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. This is a celebration of Mr. Lee, who energized a team of other good men and a nation of rugged citizens with his ideas, with gritty determination, with gripping vision and moral force to effect a rare transformation of a small post-colonial third world state into the first world modern marvel it is today. We are so pleased to have a stellar cast of former public sector leaders and thought leaders, as well as the former president himself, to address us, to take us on this tour or a festival of ideas of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. And more importantly, to take us through a critical analysis of how those ideas were effectively translated into action and reality. After all, many of you know that Mr. Lee was only interested and is only interested in ideas that work. There is no one else better suited to introduce today's program of our whirlwind tour of Mr. Lee's world of ideas than the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, Professor Kisho Mabubani. He will introduce you to the program and our very special guest for this morning, the former president. Dean, over to you, please. Thank you, Jillian. Uh, Mr. S. R. Nathan, former president of the Republic of Singapore, Professor Tan Chao Chuan, president of NUS, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this conference on the big ideas uh, of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, please let me assure you that I'll keep my opening remarks brief, and having learned the bad habit from my guru, Ambassador Tomiko, I'll only make three points. <laughs> uh, I'll talk about the birthdays of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, the ideas we will discuss today, and the program for today. First of all, may I, if you don't mind, encourage you to rise for a minute. Can you please rise? <laughs> and now join me in a round of applause and let's wish Mr. Lee Kuan Yew a happy birthday today. Thank you, thank you. I'm sure you all want to wish him a happy birthday and also wish him many more happy and healthy years. As you know, he turns 90 today. And our school has a very special connection with the birthdays of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew because it was on the occasion of his 80th birthday 10 years ago that the idea of establishing a school of public policy was mooted. Until he turned 80, Mr. Lee had steadfastly refused to have his name attached to any institution or building in Singapore. He said, uh, very famously, that he had been to many developing countries where leaders had attached their names everywhere. And when they died, the names had been scrubbed out. He didn't want that to happen to him. And as he said at the 80th birthday dinner, and I quote, we have studiously avoided the buildup of personality cults, displays of paintings, photos, statues of leaders. The only photos the government sponsors are those of the president and his wife, unquote. 
Fortunately, he gave us his name. Our school was launched a year after his 80th birthday in the DPM Taman Shamugratnam in his capacity then as Minister of Education launched it on August 4, 2004. And as you know, nine years have passed since then. And this is why today we are celebrating both Mr. Lee's 90th birthday and the ninth anniversary of our school. And as you could tell from the video we showed to you, the school has come a long way in nine years. And there is also no doubt that we have come a long way because of the gift of Mr. Lee's name. In nine years, we have become the third best endowed school of public policy in the world, the second most generous school of public policy in the world, and probably the first in launching a bold and integrated multidisciplinary curriculum. The single biggest donor to our school is Dr. Lee Ka Sheng, and in January 2007, I went to call on him with Ambassador Ho Gim, and I'm glad uh, Ho Gim is here today, who was then our Consul General in Hong Kong. I brought along with me a three-paragraph letter from Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, and we left half an hour later with a pledge for $100 million. Now, I've shared this story with uh, presidents of leading uh, Ivy League universities, including Harvard and Yale, and who are all seasoned fundraisers, and their jaws drop when I tell them how a three-paragraph letter generated $100 million for our school. Such is the power of a three-paragraph letter from Mr. Lee. I also want to add here that our academic achievements also stand out. We are doing well in all three fields of education, research, and executive education. And as you can see, we've been entrusted with a major responsibility uh, in our mission statement, inspiring leaders, improving lives, and transforming Asia. And to attract future leaders from Asia, we have to provide generous scholarships. And we've been able to do this, and we have become, as I said earlier, the second most generous school of public policy because of all your support. And so I want to thank you very much for the support uh, that you've given us. And here on a practical note, I want to add that we know that many of you want to honor Mr. Lee Kuan Yew on his 90th birthday. Therefore, NUS and our school have decided that any donation that we receive in the course of his 90th year will be regarded as a contribution to honor Mr. Lee, uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. And this year, in particular, on behalf of the school, I want to thank the Lee Foundation for donating $20 million to our school and to NUS, the Singapore Tote Board for committing $17 million over the next five years, Mr. and Mrs. Gordon Tang for donating $0.5 million, Tamasek Holdings for committing $270,000 over the next three years for the Tamasek Distinguished Visitors Program, and the last donation, which is the smallest donation of $100,000, I want to give a special mention to because Mr. Wong Chen Leong of Phun Wat and Company, and I've never met him, came to our website, logged on to the website, and said, I want to contribute $100,000. So I'm sure you'll agree that that's a role model for all Singapore citizens <laughs> uh, to do. <laughs> I hope he's here, by the way. Let me now turn quickly to the second point on the topic of this conference, the big ideas of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. And on the topic, let me begin with a very bold statement. And the bold statement is this. The lives of every Singaporean has been touched by the ideas of Mr. Lee. And our lives have also been improved in many dimensions because Mr. Lee was interested in, human, in improving human welfare in several dimensions. He became Prime Minister, as you know, in 1959, and I was then 11 years old. And I can tell you, from my personal experience, how much my life improved in the course of his Prime Ministership. 
uh, first thing that happened was that uh, a few years after he became prime minister, a flush toilet appeared in our house. And I can tell you, that was really the single biggest improvement in my life. Now, many of you don't understand this because you've never lived in a, life without, in a, in a house without a flush toilet. I have, and I can tell you what a difference it made. And then, of course, we had scholarships, bursaries, full employment, and many of us experienced this transition from relative poverty to relative affluence. Indeed, when Mr. Lee became prime minister in 1959, our per capita income was only US $400. By the time he stepped down, it had gone up to about almost $12,000, an increase of almost 30 times in 31 years. And I, let me stress this point, no other prime minister has raised his people's per capita income as fast and as high as Prime Minister Lee has. Having worked closely with Mr. Lee personally, and also with Singapore's other founding fathers like Dr. Go Keng Sui and Mr. Rajaratnam, I know from first-hand experience that these leaders thought very hard and very deep about protecting and enhancing Singapore's long-term interests and constantly improving the lives of Singaporeans. So let me make another bold statement. The quality of mind and the quality of thinking of Singapore's founding fathers were truly exceptional and equal to the best founding fathers of the world, including those of America. They made enormous efforts to study deeply the historical experiences of many countries as they looked for the best ideas to improve and transform Singapore, and they live lives of deep learning and reflection. And this is why the conference today is important. We know that great ideas have improved the lives of Singaporeans, but we have not captured, analyzed, or dissected these ideas. And if you want these ideas to continue influencing and benefiting future generations of Singapore, Singaporeans, we need to develop a deeper understanding of these ideas. So I do want to emphasize a key point here. This is not a conference about the past of Singapore. This is also a conference about the future of Singapore because many of these ideas will remain relevant uh, in the future. Now, all this brings me to my last point. I've been watching the clock. I'm unfortunately exceeding my time allocation of 10 minutes. All I want to say in my third point is that we have a great program for you. And please look at the, I was going to give you a run through of the program, but you have the program in front of you. And I'm sure the various moderators will introduce that to you. So let me say that you are in for a great treat today. Now, all this, of course, brings me to my most important assignment up here now, which is to introduce the former president, uh, Mr. S. R. Nathan, as he's going to speak uh, immediately after me. Now, Mr. S. R. Nathan clearly needs no introduction to a Singapore audience. He's Singapore's longest serving president. Uh, all the main facets of his life are well known. So instead of telling you his life story, which has been very well captured in two recent books that Mr. Nathan has produced, I will mention three legends about Mr. Nathan's life. And I can see he looks very worried as I say that. <laughs> First, he's a man for all seasons. He has thrived and succeeded in a variety of fields from social work to geopolitics. Now that's as far away as you can get from two fields. From running a newspaper company to running a shipping company, from launching a new think tank to becoming the longest serving president, and few can match Mr. Nathan's record in serving Singapore. Secondly, he is one of Singapore's true heroes. In 1974, he personally offered himself as a hostage to the terrorist Japanese Red Army Group and flew to the Middle East before he was released. Few in Singapore clearly have been as brave as Mr. Nathan in serving Singapore's interests. Thirdly, and this is a very delicate point, uh, he's had a very interesting love life. When he was a young Tamil, he was afraid that the family of his girlfriend Umila, a young Bengali girl, would not be keen that she married a young Tamil. 
But Mr. Nathan persisted and he courted his future wife for 16 years. How many of you have courted your wife for 16 years? <laughs> so, as with anything else he did, he succeeded. <laughs> so, I'm sure you'll agree with me that we are truly privileged to have President Nathan here to address us, and it gives me great pleasure now to welcome President Nathan to the podium. Honorable Chief Justice, Mellon, Professor Tan Cho Chuan, President of NUS, uh, Professor Jaya Kumar, former Chief Justice Chan Chek Kyung, other justices, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My earliest memory of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew dates back to the early 1950s when I was a student at the Bukatima campus. He was sitting in the audience of then a public debate in Singapore organized by the University of Malaya. This was the frequent occurrence then. He had recently returned from his studies in London. His charisma was evident even at that early age. He struck me then as being extraordinarily alert and a force to be reckoned with. Since my NTUC days in the 1960s, I worked for him and with him. He gave me, a very junior civil servant, many assignments beyond my status. For some reason, he thought I could get the things done that he wanted done. What I have to say today is are reflections of the man, what and how he did what he wanted, and what impressions remain etched in my mind. It is against the backdrop of this relationship that I ask you to view what I have to say today. These reflections and impressions I formed of him are from that experience. He came to our scene in Singapore with the reputation he had made in the Milan Forum in London. Later, while handling the postal workers' strike in Singapore, he came to prominence locally. In the 50 years I've worked with him, what do I make of the man? Overall, his obsessions was always with Singapore and his deep anxiety about our future. But there was always his confidence that if we worked together, we would overcome whatever dangers threatened us. Perhaps this explained why he was always fearless in advocating our cause and fighting against the odds that, like threats of communist intimidation and chauvinistic threats. He gave us the courage as a people to stand up and have the strength to fight those threats and intimidations. This was at a time when most of us were cowed by such intimidation. We then faced a very bleak future. When independence came, we were in a region where nationalistic neighbors were determined to cut Singapore off from the middleman role 
that we had traditionally performed. To survive, he exhorted us to create a Singapore different from our neighborhood. This we did. Singapore is now a brand name. We are sought after, we are very much sought after by others. We are viewed as a capable people, honest in our dealings and hardworking. That was not the case when self-government came to us in 1959 and then independence in 1965. That is what he wanted us to be. It was around the mid-1950s that he became active in our local political scene. It began with his election to the Legislative Assembly. It was in such times in the 1950s that he also began his foray internationally, taking part in political events <coughs> and gatherings abroad. With his active participation abroad, he began developing and bringing Singapore to the attention of the peoples and leaders way beyond our shores, particularly among important political circles elsewhere in the non-aligned world. During self-government from 59, he attended various overseas forums where he began speaking about Singapore and the political aspirations of his people. We were then a colony, yet he made us look like a country at such gatherings. Later in the 60s, traveling in Africa and later in New Delhi and Rangoon on a mission for Malaysia, he also brought along and conveyed a sense of Singapore and its aspirations. Singapore thus got itself catapulted into people's consciousness, particularly among leaders in Africa and the important political centers of Asia. During those times, he even brought prominent Afro-Asian personalities to visit Singapore and speak at public forums. For instance, among others, Farhad Abbas, the Algerian leader who spoke from the City Hall steps. Through his participation at these overseas gatherings, he garnered their support for Singapore despite the fact that we were still a colony. In that sense, he brought Singapore to the attention of their leaders and peoples of the, of the political world and made our aspirations as a colonized people known to them. From my own experiences attending the Afro-Asian People's Solidarity Organization conference conventions, I found the foundation he had built there most helpful. And all this was well before we became independent in 1965. The African leaders I met were all conscious of Singapore, and Mr. Lee's name was what they all linked to us. The response was almost immediate. I met people like Ben Bella, who was leader of Algeria then, Ahmad Sekutore of French Guinea, Julius Narere of Tanzania, and they all seemed to have a special place for him. The exclamation at the mention of Singapore and their responses helped, me, op helped to open many doors for me at these conferences. And Mr. Lee's name and reputation could also have had an effect on a wider stage. For example, when the Commonwealth met in Singapore in 1971, there was the danger of the conf conference breaking up over arms sale to South Africa. It was his standing in the eyes of African leaders that helped the conference avert a collapse and ride over the problem, ending in a successful conference. His other cardinal contribution to us is none other than his resolve and commitment to multiracialism as the principle on which our political philosophy stands. 
It was not something he adopted out of political expediency. His strong commitment to multiracialism has been his creed and inherent belief since his student days in London. Way back in, the, in 1950, speaking to a Malayan forum in London while still a student, he had this message for Malayan and Singapore students, and I quote, <coughs> The prerequisite of Malayan independence is the, is the exist, is existence of a Malayan society, not Malay, not Malayan Chinese, not Malayan Indian, not Malayan Eurasian, but Malayan, one that embraces the various races already in the country, unquote. Later on independence here, he said almost the same thing, speaking to, of the Singapore he wanted to see, and I quote, we are going to have a multiracial nation in Singapore. We will set the example. This is not a Malay nation. This is not a Chinese nation. This is not an Indian nation. Everybody will have this peace place equal. Language, culture, religion. One thing we should not do is to try and, and stifle the other man's culture, his language, his religion, because that is the surest way to bring him to abundant reason and rationality and stand by his heritage." Unquote. He has preached to multiracialism ever since and put it into practice. During Singapore's days in Malaysia, he tried to convince all Malaysians of the value of that philosophy. Unfortunately, that message was misunderstood and led to Singapore's expulsion. Since independence, multiracialism has been our creed. At independence, he did not fail, fall to the temptation of adhering to those who advocated catering to the wishes of the majority in terms of language and religion and race. He stood determined to uphold his beliefs in multiracialism, in language, in religion, and in politics. Thus, over nearly 60 years after, he continues to be steadfast in practicing what he had earlier preached, that is, multiracial Singapore. From his earliest days in politics, he realized that Singapore politics must transcend racial lines and a small country like us could not be divided against itself. Thus, he remained committed to the practice of multiracialism, and we are the beneficiaries of his call. Some of the distinguished speakers here today will no doubt be addressing the issue of Mr. Lee's role in Singapore's diplomacy and how he enlarged Singapore's international space. I will not cover this ground in my remarks, but I want to make an observation relating to it. When Mr. Lee created this space for Singapore, he was very clear in pointing out to the big powers that Singapore was different from them and from others. He made clear that we had our own system we would be no one's lackey, and we would be accepted on those terms. Let me recount for you an incident from an earlier era, which reinforced this conviction and left a deep impression on me. It occurred during Mr. Lee's first official visit to China in 1976. During a meeting with the Chinese Premier, Kofeng, Mr. Lee was presented by Mr. Kwa with a copy of a book by an Australian academic, Neville Maxwell, on the Sino-Indian War of 1962. Premier Kofeng presented the book, telling Mr. Lee that, and I quote him, this is the correct version of the India-China War. 
I was sitting quite close to the Prime Minister and Foreign Minister Rajaratnam, perhaps in the row just behind them. When Mr. Lee took the book, he looked at the front cover and looked at the back cover and then handed it back to Premier Hua and saying, Mr. Prime Minister, this is your version of the war. There is another version, the Indian version. And in any case, I am from Southeast Asia. It is nothing to do with us. Prime Minister Hua Kofeng showed no reaction, but a silence fell in the room. Mrs. Chao Kuan Hua, the wife of the foreign minister, an important functionary of the Chinese side at that time, got up and walked away. Her husband, Foreign Minister Chao Kuan Hua, the Chinese Foreign Minister, who was some seats away in the same row, was seen abruptly putting away the paper he was holding in his hand. I may be exaggerating if he showed a sign of displeasure. There was a silence for a while and the conversations resumed. The response by Mr. Lee touched me immensely. Before the meeting, for two, three days, we had all been shown the sights of Beijing to impress us of the greatness of China and her past. To do such a thing at that first official meeting with another leader of Chinese origin was something no one could have expected. I was moved by the way Mr. Lee handed back the book and what he said. This confirmed to me that he might be ethnically Chinese, but was not subordinate to China. Even to this day, I sometimes get asked about this incident by people who cannot bring themselves to believe that the Prime Minister of a small country like Singapore would have dared to incur Chinese displeasure by such a manner of response. Another area where his contributions have received worldwide acclaim has been his ability to govern our small red dot and transform it to what it is. He, above all others, has made Singapore what it is in the eyes of the world today. In my earlier career and later as president, I've frequently been asked, how did he do it? Frankly, it is not easy for any of us to be able to explain. Short of hearing from himself, none of us will be able to hazard a guess. If at all one could speak of it from having observed him in action, all I can say is that he undertook the task to transform Singapore learning on the job as things progressed. When he entered politics, he was then a budding lawyer, successful in his profession. He entered government with no experience of either government or corporate life. He had never worked in the government or been part of a statutory board, bank, or corporate leadership. Yet where did he learn to govern us in the way he did? That is a question many ask and it's hard to answer. But as he entered politics and right from the outset, it was evident to people like us that he and his colleagues, the pioneers like Dr. Go King Sri, Dr. To Chin Chai, Mr. Yong Yuk Lin, Mr. Lim Kim San, or Mr. Ong Pang Boon, were all learning on the job and were going to transform the machinery of, Sing of government. He was always determined to intervene in administration and change not only policies, but the way they were implemented, how they impacted on our people and how it served them better. From the day he took office, he seemed to know how to lead us as a people and bring about change. 
In doing it, he brought to bear the qualities of his personal character, making observers feel that he was born to lead. From the time he came into our lives, he has engaged our dreams, mobilized our energies, and led us as if promising us to lead us to the promised land. He had the will to move us, believing he could rouse the people to take up the challenge. He seemed so sure that, you knew, he, that he knew how to do it with certainty. When he took office, he quickly understood the realities of the situation confronting Singapore. Inheriting a collapsing economy, he worked closely with Dr. Go King Sui and grew our economy into the dynamic one we have today. Not always with a light hand. With each year of experience, he made difficult decisions, moving us away from our entrepreneur dependency to what we are today. <clears throat> and always applying the values of science and technology to upgrade our economy to be what it is today. He did all this by studying the experience of others and drawing lessons from their successes and failures. <coughs> Since independence, in 1965, everything he did or said was subordinate to one thing, the survival of Singapore and its people. He has always urged us to prepare ourselves to confront the dangers ahead in an ever-changing, often turbulent world. <coughs> when we emerged into independence, Singapore was not fully formed as a country or as a nation. We entered into the international area to take our place among established nations. Many skeptics doubted if we would survive. It was his reassuring word and constant exhortations, together with the tireless work of our first foreign minister, Mr. S. Rajaratnam, that gave us the strength to face the imponderable future. He navigated us through troubled waters with such skill that by the 1970s, the picture around us and within had changed dramatically. During the rough and tumble of our early days, there were sh shrinking alliances. Some deserted him in the expectation we would all fail. Others stood by him and took the stand against odds. What I will always remember is how he consistently pursued his interest in Singapore with passion and without loss of enthusiasm, even as the dangers heightened or receded. He was always conscious and up-to-date of the political, economic and social issues facing us as a country. In a crisis, he could be impatient often wanting a quick solution. But one still left much, left such meetings persuaded by the compelling purpose of what he was trying to achieve, be it in politics or in economics. Whatever he heard, he absorbed and processed it in his mind with amazing speed. Whatever he wanted his interlocutors to hear, he would engage them such that they focus their entire attention to what he had to say. In these exchanges, he was supremely confident about what he wanted to achieve. When talking about him, one has to reckon with, the, with, with his intelligence and his overpowering grasp of things. He, he grasped the nature of the world Singapore found itself and the way things were moving for or against us and our interests. For this, he never depended on what we officials purveyed to him. He read widely. 
he was never satisfied until he understood for himself the accuracy of the facts that were presented to him. What he did not grasp, he kept probing. In this way, he absorbed information on economic and political developments, sorted them out in his mind, and made a sense of them before he responded. His analytical power of addressing developing situations was always spot on. He was able to get to this nub of the, of the issue and point out to us what was vital. He also had a great ability to communicate his idea and to small and large groups, especially what he had on his mind, which were sometimes cryptic. Depending on the situation, his audience might, have, might be made up of many who may not have been well versed in English. On such occasions, he would comment or criticize using a Malay or a Chinese dialect expression and res that resonated with the average man and even humored the audience. I want to end with one word which may surprise some of you. It is about his caring nature and my single most moving experience of it, among other things. And there were many such experiences. In 1967, I was sent as a junior officer to take notes of his meeting with the visiting Thai foreign minister. I hurriedly put on a tie and jacket and rushed to the assignment. On my arrival at the door, the Prime Minister came close to me, adjusted my necktie, and said with almost paternal touch these words. The next quote. Nadam, you must remember you are no longer in the labor movement. Unquote. I was moved beyond words. I had grown up without a father or an elder brother. Here was the Prime Minister himself coming down to my level to do, to do what they would have done for me. That instance of his caring nature I experience many times later in life something most people do not attribute to him. On that note, I will end and wish you a successful conference. Thank you. <laughs>